This is Beekeeper Confidential. I'm your host, Mandy Shaw. If your social media feed was anything like mine this last week on Valentine's Day, you would have seen numerous posts about St. Valentine, the patron saint of beekeepers. St. Valentine was in charge of sweetening the honey and giving protection to the beekeepers, but can't he revisit that to do something to add in about, I don't know, destroying varroa mites? When I think about bees, I can't help but to think about romance. The sounds and smells and the tastes are all very seductive and they leave me longing for the next infusion of sensory sweetness. But did you know that the greatest love story of all time also has a connection to bees? Today we visit with Lois Levine, a historical novelist who revisited Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet to tell the tale of Juliet's nurse, and along the way became seduced by bees. I know Lois from the beekeeping community here in Portland, and she's the host for the annual honey tasting for Portland Urban Beekeepers. When I saw her a couple of months ago, I invited her onto the show, and she said, we have to do a Valentine's special. So forget about all the red, pink mylar heart balloons, and the flower bouquets, and the chocolate-dipped strawberries, and let's get to the real heart of the matter, bees. about him. And so when I'm inventing her story, I have to think about what 
see what it had been like. And I needed a job for him to do. I knew from that class position that he wouldn't have done anything that was sort of skilled labor because he would have had to be a guild member and they wouldn't have been in that class position. But I wanted him to do something more interesting than, you know, just like moving rocks from one place to another. Mm -hmm. So as I was thinking about and investigating, researching what jobs people had in that time period, and I should say that I also always love to write about food. It's a great way to draw audiences into your fiction to have descriptions of what things smell like and taste like. Mm -hmm. And I realized as I was researching this period, late medieval Italy, how important beekeeping was, both for honey, which was a primary sweetener, but also for beeswax. This was a time period in which flame provided the way that you lit things, the way that you heated things, and the way that you cooked. And especially when it came to lighting, having these sex candles would be like going to the fanciest lighting store in your town and buying the fanciest chandelier, <laughs> because most of what was burned would either have been a torch or it would have been animal fat, and it would have been smokier, in some cases greasier. So beeswax was upscale lighting. And that's really what started me both thinking about this character and thinking about beekeeping. And very early on in the writing of this book, I thought, well, I don't know anything about bees. How am I going to learn? And I was lucky enough to see an announcement about Portland Urban Beekeepers mm. having toured a hive, which is an opportunity to go around and visit the different beehives that backyard beekeepers have in Portland. Uh -huh. So I convinced my sweetheart that we should go do that. And I would say when we got to the first uh, hives, which are actually the hives that are out at Finger Farm, my partner was kind of nervous about being around the bees. He was standing probably 25 feet away from the hive <laughs> and just a little terrified of it. I was entranced. And before the day was over, he was entranced too. In fact, by the end of the day, I turned to him and said, I think we should have a beehive in a backyard. Oh, like, wow. yeah, I love that idea. <laughs> um, uh, we do have a hive in our backyard, and we are, as I like to say, I'm a lazy beekeeper. Mm -hmm. So really what I do is I let another urban beekeeper who has more hives than he has room in his yard uh, keep hives in my backyard. Once I got the bees in my yard, I, I sit right in front of that hive for hours at a time just watching them, and I've really learned that there's no need to be afraid, even when kids come over in my yard for bee lands on them, I always say, you know, the bee doesn't want to hurt you and you don't want to hurt the bee. So the bee lands and just holds still until it flies away. And if it takes a while and it doesn't seem like it's going to fly away, let me know. And I did um, have a kid in my yard who started to get a little bit wriggly when a bee was on her. And so I just gently transferred the bee from her hand to my hand. And I was able to be more patient and wait for it to fly off. <laughs> the thing about the beekeeping, to come back to Juliet's nurse, it actually ended up being probably the most important decision I made as the writer of that novel to make him a beekeeper because the thing that I said that I so loved about bees, they're, um, the fact that they're a super organism and that they have a hive mentality and think about themselves, think about the hive, the good of the hive rather than their individual good, yeah. that became a really important theme in the novel. So spoiler alert things do not end up so well for Juliet. <laughs> and really, as I like to say, every character that my character the nurse loves ends up dead. Like her husband is dead, her own child is dead, Juliet dies, and yet I didn't want to write a novel that was hopeless and that was only about these devastating losses. Mm -hmm. And I thought about what would help somebody to get through those losses. And I also, because it's set in Italy um, in the 14th century, if you've ever seen or visited the great cathedrals of Europe, we're always told, you know, the people, these cathedrals took centuries to build. And the people who designed them or who started building them knew that they were not going to live to see these cathedrals completed. But that didn't matter to them. They wanted to feel like they were part of something larger. And for them, it was a very spiritual experience because they knew that they were doing something that was closely related to what they felt was a respectful worship of God. And mm. we live in a culture that's moved away from that thought for many people. And I think we don't have as much of a sense of being part of something that is greater than ourselves, something that connects us to prior generations and generations that come after us. 
but that's really what bees are, and it's what they do for me. They are this sense of that bee that I see flying to collect pollen or nectar now is never going to have the bee bread or the honey from that pollen or nectar. Mm. They're not collecting for themselves. They're collecting for the hive. And so I started to think about how bees could be both literally part of the plot. You know, if I need an excuse for a character to go from one place to another, it might be that they were going to tend a hive. But they were also thematically really important because those ultimately become the way that Juliet's nurse as a character learns how to get past loss and to have a sense of connection and hope mm. all comes from the bees. And uh, when the novel first came out, one of my friends who had read my first novel and, and really loved it, um, when she picked up the second novel, she read it, and she texted me as soon as she was finished it with it, and she said, I just finished Juliet's Nurse. Thank you for the bees. And I think Aww. that's really like what beekeeping is for me. We live in a, in a moment when we have constant access to news as well as to advertising, both of which it feels like make us very anxious. Advertising does it on purpose because mm -hmm. it wants us to buy more stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think the news does it because it wants to keep us hooked on more news and it, we can feel a little bit overwhelmed by all of it. Yeah. And when I feel most overwhelmed, I go back to the bees. I think about the fact that they're building something that is communal and collaborative and is about connection over time and is about something bigger than the self. And I mean, I guess maybe I started with the idea of, you know, Romeo and Juliet as uh, retelling the world's most famous love story. But I think my love story is really that I'm in love with the bees. <laughs> Some of my research happened as close at hand as toward the hives when I was just going around and first getting to know what bees were like. Mm -hmm. And, it also took me very far afield. Uh, your listeners may remember that Romeo and Juliet is set in Verona. And so I went to Verona, Italy to do research there oh on God. the setting, on you know what would houses have looked like, all sorts of material culture. And also because I said, I, you know, I like to write about smells and tastes and to get a sense not just of the sight, but the smells and the feel of the place. And, um, while I was there, I just happened to be reading kind of the equivalent of the local weekly newspaper about events that were going on, and I discovered that um, there was a beekeeping festival that was happening in an area outside of Verona near Lake Como, and Lake, pardon me, in an area outside of Verona near Lake Garda, and I was planning on going to visit Lake Garda anyway because there were some... Uh, castles that had belonged to the ruling family of Verona there, and I wanted to see what they looked like architecturally. So in my foray into driving a rental car all through uh, Italian roads, we stopped at this Italian beekeeping festival. And it was really interesting to see the ways that it might feel familiar or different from a beekeeping festival here. And there was certainly, you know, honey and honey candies and things like that to sample. And uh, so both people who were selling products from the bees, products for keeping bees, people who are trying to get people to understand what you should do to support healthy uh, bees in the environment. And I found at this event a book about medieval Italian beekeeping. And I was so mm -hmm. excited that I bought it, even though I don't really speak Italian. <laughs> so I brought it home and I found the section that felt most relevant to me and I sat with an Italian dictionary and I kind of plotted through it and then somebody who I actually know through Portland Urban Beekeepers, her mother is from Italy and I said, do you think if I sent these to your mother, she would be willing to just read them over? I felt like I had done the hardest work of the basic translation, but would your mother make sure that I hadn't made any mistakes? And she said, oh yeah, I think that my mother could do that. And so I actually have this resource that was written by scholars of medieval Italian beekeeping. But as usual, <laughs> you always have to rely on the kindness of beekeepers to help you make sure that your own translation is accurate enough. And um, it's been fun when I now sometimes will be a host site for the Tour de Haas, and I leave out some of my beekeeping books, including the book about Italian beekeeping, to share with people the idea that this has been something that's been 
these inhumans have coexisted for certainly for centuries, um, perhaps for millennia, and that um, it, it's part of, again, like the fun of doing historical research for me is discovering little things like how would a beekeeper have kept bees in Italy and what would have been similar or what would have felt really different in terms of what we know and do today. Along the way, what I discovered was that Portland had some very arcane rules about beehives. The rules for keeping bees in the city of Portland, Oregon, are about as old as I am. And they are clearly were written with this idea of providing public safety without much knowledge about what that would take. Lois used her gifts as a researcher and a communicator to revisit the requirements for beekeeping in Portland to make it more educational for non-beekeepers and more accessible for beekeepers. Her mindset was inspired by the bees. I'm going to think like a bee. The reason that I love bees so much is that bees aren't individualists. They think of the communal good. Mm-hmm. So they're not worried about their own individual benefit or survival. They're worried about the benefit and survival of the hive. And I thought, well, even if I could work with this guy, that would only be my individual benefit. What would happen to somebody who felt less empowered to engage with city and county officials or who might be limited in their language or might, because of their work schedule, not be able to engage with city and county officials. Mm -hmm. So I spent, I can't even remember now, I feel like it was almost two years Mm -hmm. working on changing the way that this enforcement happened. And as I do it, I've heard stories from other beekeepers. You know, somebody who said, oh yeah, when we wanted a neighbor to sign we asked the neighbor to sign, and he said, oh, I'll sign that if you help me move this piece of furniture. And then I thought, well, what if this neighbor asked for money? What if the neighbor asked you to go on a date with them? Like, right. you know, it was just weird. That's like beekeeper um, blackmail. Yeah, and it turned out that actually most of the beekeepers in Portland didn't have permits. And I didn't like the idea of beekeeping being something that we were doing in violation of the law. Mm. I want beekeepers to be thought of as responsible people who obey the law yeah. um, and who are doing something that's beneficial. Uh, you know, my backyard neighbors were really excited about the bees coming. They have fruit trees in their yard and they wanted my bees to be pollinating their fruit trees. And I, that's the way I want people to feel about bees. So I ended up finding, after a lot of conversation with a lot of people, I found somebody really supportive at the city of Portland. And also we reached out to some of the county commissioners and we finally got the person at the county to understand that notification is different than permission and to change the rules. And I actually helped the county write an information sheet that they could use for beekeepers as you are um, applying for your permit to give them something to send to their neighbors so that neighbors would understand. I think there are a lot of people who believe that they're allergic to bee stings. I mm-hmm. actually used to be one of these people because I once got stung and I, you know, and it got wet and swollen. And so somebody said, oh, you might be allergic. And it turns out that that's a normal reaction to a bee sting. And when, but when we talk about somebody who's got a, an allergy, we really need an anaphylactic shock, which is life-threatening and it involves your throat closing. And if you are in that position, you should probably always have something to remedy that with you because you can yes. get stung any place that you are. You don't have to be in your backyard because you have a neighborhood beekeeper. Yeah. I can't and, tell you how many times I've had somebody say, you got to get these, like the swarm catch or something. You got to get the bees out of here. I'm allergic. I'm like, well, do you have an EpiPen? Oh, no. Well, (laughs) if you really are allergic, you need an EpiPen. And that most people are not allergic. The rate of allergy is about 1% of the population. Yeah, it's really Um, low. It's it's quite low. And so I was excited to have this information sheet uh, be part of the way that the county helps people understand the value of bees and beekeeping and understand why you don't need to wear a beekeeping suit if you're in the backyard with a beehive Mm -hmm. um, and and things like that. So that was like a big political turn. And then I became sort of a hero for more beekeepers (laughs) because people were able to have their hives be legal. And I think beekeeping has become much more popular in recent years. And it's really important. We urged everybody through Portland Urban Beekeepers who had not gotten permitted to get permitted. Efforts like this have paved the way for the newest guidelines in residential beekeeping. 
House Bill 2653 was introduced into the Oregon Legislature with the intent of creating a common-sense guideline for nuisance-free residential beekeeping that cities and local governments can use to develop or change their existing ordinances with a better understanding of what beekeeping is all about. Since this has gone into effect, the City of Portland no longer requires a permit for beekeeping. However, the Oregon Department of Agriculture does require that beekeepers with more than five colonies register each year for a small fee. I'll put a link to the guidelines and to the apiary registration application in the show notes from today. If you live in a place that has rigid beekeeping regulations, I'd like to hear from you. Send me an email at waggleworkspdx at gmail.com. Now, back to the story. So I'm going to read a little section and... The things you need to know are Pietro is the name that I gave her husband. Tybalt, uh, your listeners may remember, is the name of a character from the play that was Juliet's cousin, who the nurse in Shakespeare's play refers to as the best friend she ever had. So, of course, he used to be a big character in my book. Mm. Uh, and she's going to talk a little bit about uh, soldi and denari, which are just the coins that were used in Italy at this time. And there's a little bit more. The one other thing folks might need to know is she talks about the pestilence, which we would think of as the plague, which was devastating to Italy in yeah. this time period. And so when she talks about the pestilence, she means that there's a recurrence of the plague. She thinks of the family that we think of as the Capulets. That's very Shakespearean. It's a British version of what would have been the Italian name, the Capuletti. So that's what I call them in the book. Okay. Again, spoiler alert, things don't work out well for Juliet. And as I was writing the novel, I had to figure out where to take the nurse as the protagonist and the narrator beyond that loss of Juliet, which kind of compounds all these other losses that she's experienced. So the chapter that follows the chapter in which Juliet dies begins like this. I pull the edge of my widow's veil down over my neck and tuck the corners inside my dress. And I pass my hands close to the torch so they'll bear the scent of smoke. And sheathing my newly purchased knife, I cut the first warm slice. It's the day before Lammas Eve, time to begin my harvest. I'd not paid much I'd not paid much heed when Pietro taught Tybalt about the working of a hive. Or in the years afterward, when Tybalt repeated what he'd learned, eager to offer me something of my lost Pietro. But now I gather every memory skimming all I can. It's the warmth that most surprises me. The heat from countless thousand bees clings to the sticky weight of what I take from them, as though something lives and breathes and beats within the golden liquid covering the comb. My thick hands have never been more grateful, more careful, than cradling their warm, honey-coated wax into the rounded pot. I had not anticipated how fast the pot would fill or how heavy the full pot would be, how I'd struggle to lift it, and how careful my, I must be to bear it off upright. Each step chinks the sack of hidden coins against me, though I'll bruise purple from it before the harvesting is done. There's a solace in feeling the weight of my long saved foldy and denari, that assurance there'll be more to come. Pestilence snakes across Corona once more. No one can say for how long it will ravage, who will be lost before it's done. In such times, the righteous will call for candles, and the wicked for bodily delights. Wax for one, honey for the other, and either way a well-earned silver to keep me. The harvesting takes longer than I expected, a half day, and I'm still at the first hive, deciding how much comb to take, how much to leave. I must calculate what each family of bees will need to survive the winter, and what they can spare for me. To survive, to spare, to be spared. I would not have thought such choices would be mine, but I labor with the same droning purpose as the bees, relying on them, as they rely on me. While I work, I imagine the weeks that will follow. I'll skim and strain my many pots as what I've gathered slowly separates. I do not yet know who or where the chandler is that I might bargain with, how my long past years of marketplace haggling will serve me now that I'll sell instead of buy. Tybalt spent whole seasons clinging close to Pietro, without either of them suspecting how soon he'd be left to carry on alone. None of us ever dreamt such tasks would one day fall to me. 
I suppose the hives will need me less as the days cool to autumn, frost to winter. I'll have time to take my coins to the Piazza dell'Erbe, or maybe all the way to Villafranca. I'll trade for spices and teach myself to make such comfits as Pietra sold. I have to say that by the point where I'm actually writing the novel, I realize that one thing I want to do is make sure that people who read it aren't scared of bees. And so I have the nurse be scared of bees at the beginning of the novel, and by the end she's kind of outgrowing it. So here's a point um, where she's thinking about the comfits or the honey candies that her husband used to make before he died. I slip a slice of comb into my mouth and suck the honey off. Savoring the taste, I reach greedily for more comb. I sense too late that a bee is crawling there. In the startled flash, she sinks her only weapon in. The burn, the sting, the too familiar pain shoots through my clumsy finger. For weeks it will ache me, but it's worse for her, for in that angry instant she is dead. Did I ever fear bees? Was I afraid of how a sting might hurt me? I cradle the poor bee in my palm and weep for costing with my carelessness for life. A foolish sentiment, but I'll not forego it. What would Pietro me, shedding tears over a bee? I imagine he might whistle just to niddle me. Then he'd pinch the stinger out, kiss the pain away, rub honey where I hurt. Tell me how he adores me, how glad he is to see how I've grown to love his bees. He'd remind me of what I already know. Loving what's in this life is our only remedy for death. But I also know the more you love, the more you have to lose. I weep for him, for her, for me. But then I press close my veil to dry my tears. I wave my swelling finger near to the smoky flame and heave myself back to my task. Whole hives still need my tending. So as you can see, the nurse comes to love the bees as much as Lois the beekeeper does. Oh, Lois, thank you so much. Sure, this has been fun. I didn't even realize I had so much to say, and I had to say, (laughs) you got me to go back and look at my own writing and realize, oh yeah, I like this book. I forgot how much I like this book, so thank you. Oh, here's a little extra something I forgot to say. There are two covers, because there's one, there's a U.S. cover, and then there's the cover from the Canadian version of the book. Oh. It's a different publisher in Canada. So it's from an interest in the U.S. And in Canada, it was um, Random House Canada. And they actually, on the book, it looks like there's honey dripping down on the back cover of the book. And it's textural. So if you, when you pick up the book, it's like really raised bumps. It's fantastic. <gasps> All right. Thanks so much, Lois. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye, Brandy. <laughs> Bye. If you want to learn more about Lois, visit my blog at waggleworkspdx.com. I'll be including links to her website, where you can purchase her books, and more from today's show. If you're enjoying Beekeeper Confidential, consider becoming a patron. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help support this show and my work with the bees. Visit patreon.com forward slash Mandy Shaw to learn more. If you can't become a patron, that's okay too. By liking and sharing on social media or telling your beekeeper friends about us, you're helping to share the stories that we tell here. I also have Beekeeper Confidential stickers available in my shop for five bucks and they include a handwritten note from yours truly. Bee season is less than two months away. I am so vitamin B deficient, it's not even funny. I've got hive boxes built, swarm trap locations confirmed, and a new apiary to grow, and my bee gear is packed and ready for action. Also, the bee dreams have started. Do you have bee dreams? Share with me, and I just might read it on an upcoming episode. Until next time, may the buzz be with you.
Gatekeeper Confidential is a Waggle Works production. It's written and produced by Mandy Shaw.